right, what in the world are we supposed to do with the stock of Netflix here? Yesterday afternoon, the streaming video Kingpin reported what many people are calling a better than feared quarter. I'm hearing that it's time to take Netflix out of the penalty box after it botched the last quarter in July, that this company has been redeemed, that they've done just enough to get themselves back on track. I don't buy it. After really digging into this quarter, I think it was soft. There's definitely not enough in here to take Netflix out of the penalty box. That'd be a mistake. If you still want it, I recommend taking advantage of today's bounce to ring the register. I'm going to tell you why. By the way, I like this company for a long time. First, you got to understand what Netflix is up against, because when you look at these numbers in context, I think they're pretty discouraging. You did a vacuum. It was an OK quarter, but we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a world where Netflix is facing an onslaught of competition as everybody and their mother rushes to launch their own streaming service. I think like I should have one of my uh, service. I mean, I'm not kidding. That's how many are coming. Well, some of these are already out. The heavy hitters haven't even launched yet. Apple's rolling out its streaming video platform in two weeks. People are making a little joke that they don't have enough content. It, they got billions of dollars. They want content, they can get it. Disney Plus is coming out a little less than a month. They're both going to have vast libraries of content, especially Disney, and they're both going to be a lot cheaper than Netflix, five bucks, seven bucks a month, respectively. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Warner Media is coming. In other words, Netflix just reported their last quarter pre-Apple TV Plus at, at Dis- and Disney Plus. App, uh, going forward, the big question is whether or not Netflix can hold off these new rivals. And what we saw last night does not inspire a ton of confidence for me. I Look, I, you know what? I used the stock of Roku to measure new competitors, and it went bonkers today. Sure sign that more streaming services are coming on strong, and this is not a case where the more is the merrier. Even before the Disney-Apple tag team enters the ring, this company already faces some real headwinds. Netflix was a $385 stock in July. $385, people! Then they reported a botched quarter, and the darn thing spent months selling off, ultimately bottoming at $252 late last month. At those levels, it started feeling too cheap to ignore, which is why it rebounded to $286 as of yesterday's close. But man, oh man, the Bears had a field day with that last quarter. After pushing through a price increase early this year, the company's subscriber growth tanked. Remember, unlike most stocks, Netflix doesn't typically trade uh, based on sales or earnings. It trades on new signups. That's the metric. So even though they reported a decent earnings beat last night, all anyone really cared about were the anemic subscriber numbers. Netflix added 2.7 million paid uh, members worldwide. Wall Street was looking for 5 million. That was awful. The combination of a major shortfall overseas and domestic subscriptions that actually declined for the first time since the company decoupled the streaming service from the old DVD rental service in 2011. The source of the weakness, management told us, we don't believe competition was a factor since there wasn't a material change in the cognitive competitive landscape during Q2, end quote. Plus, the new competitors are only popping up in certain regions, but Netflix's subscriber shortfall was worldwide. The culprit? Imagine blame the price increases and the fact that, I quote, Q2's content slate drove less growth in paid net ads than we anticipated, end quote. Although they also noted that they did huge numbers in the previous quarter, so there may have been a pull forward effect. In July, Netflix sounded confident about their ability to get things on track as long as they focused on the fundamentals. You know, they kind of were pretty bullish here. They told us that the third quarter started with the insanely popular third season of Stranger Things, and the first two weeks were strong. Two weeks. At the time, the company told us to expect 7 million new paid subscribers worldwide in the coming quarter, 6.2 million in the the rest of the world, 800,000 here in the U.S. Remember those numbers. Now, the stock still got obliterated in July, and it kept falling until a month ago when it finally bounced off its lows. But that's the context going into last night. There was a huge subscriber shortfall last quarter. Management promised that they'd be able to get things on track. So did they... Well, look, if you only looked at the stock action today, with the stock ultimately rallying seven bucks, but it was up, up size 22 bucks at one point, you might think that Netflix actually did deliver. And in some ways, they did. The company posted a gigantic earnings beat. Earnings. They made $1.47. Street's looking for buck three. They're making a fortune thanks to those price hikes. But what about the subscriber numbers? Again, remember I told you that's the real metric? Those numbers were a lot more mixed. While international signups expected uh, were a bit better than expected, coming in 6.3 million, the domestic numbers, wow, they stunk. Just 517,000 when management was forecasting 800,000. I know 517,000 is a big number, but not when you're expecting 800. All told, 
They didn't quite hit the 7 million figure they were guiding for, even if they came a lot closer than last time. Still, this was their most accurate forecast in recent history. What's holding back the U.S. business? Netflix explained an uptick in churn. Quote, since our U.S. price increase earlier this year, retention has not yet fully returned on a sustained basis to pre-price change levels, which has led to slower U.S. membership growth. End quote. Translation, they're losing more customers than they used to. And that's weighing on the numbers. As Barclays pointed out, a small increase in churn like this can translate into some real pain. We're talking 2 million fewer net subscriber additions annually at this pace. That's a lot. Now, some of the analysts were more critical. Macquarie actually downgraded the stock from buy to neutral in these numbers. They think the U.S. business has reached a point of saturation, another key word, where it's going to have a much harder time growing, especially with Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus coming next month. Even if they don't do much damage to the subscriber base, Macquarie's betting they'll make it much harder for Netflix to keep raising prices. That's something I agree with. I didn't always. I used to think they could take it up a lot, but not with all these competitors. Plus, with so many streaming services that are competing for content itself, the cost of quality programming keeps rising. This is something the bears have been warning about for ages, but it never really mattered while Netflix was a turbocharged growth stock that was consistently adding massive numbers of new subscribers. Now it's not. The other worry, even though Netflix has become quite profitable, it's still got negative cash flow. Their free cash flow came in at a negative $551 million, and they're expecting $3.5 billion of cash burn for the full year. Well, that's an improvement, and these numbers should slowly get better over time. In the interim, Netflix told us that they'll keep selling high-yield bonds to fund their investments in growing the business. Suboptimal. For next quarter, management's forecasting 7.6 million new signups, 600,000 here, 7 million in the rest of the world. That's much weaker than expected. The analysts were uh, just hoping for 9.5 million not that long ago. Ouch. On top of that, their sales and earnings forecasts were also pretty light. Put it all together, and I think Netflix has reached a point of saturation domestically. Even with Stranger Things 3, they couldn't hit the forecast. Worse, the companies had two subscriber shortfalls in a row. And that's before the new competition from Disney and Apple even hits. What could save them? Netflix needs to start posting some extraordinary subscriber growth overseas. They may do it. They have a lot of great uh, a lot of great productions overseas, so it can happen. They're understanding what people want region by region. It is unparalleled. They do a lot of R&D about this, but they need to do better than they're doing. Why not give Netflix more credit for its incredible profitability? Well, because this is a subscriber growth story. And if you value the stock on earnings, well, it, it, it's at 53 times. So that's not the way to look at it. The bottom line, today Netflix reported a quarter that was in many ways better than feared, as I said at the top of the show. But that's all it was. I wouldn't short Netflix here too risky. But until we see how they handle Disney and Apple, I absolutely wouldn't want you to own it either. Andrew in Illinois. Andrew. Hello, Jim. This is Andrea, Andrew's mom. We watch every day, and we really enjoy your show. Hi, Kramer. My name is Andrew, and I'm eight years old. And I. this is my second time calling you. And my question is, should I buy some more Disney or sell it? Why would you sell it there, Andrew? you got your whole life ahead of you. You're eight years old. Congratulations. And Andrew's mom, fantastic, too. Disney is a buy, and it's one of the great long-term stories. My executive producer just got back from Disney World, and you know what? Not bad. Not bad. She had a great time. Her daughter wanted to be like a Jedi warrior instead of princess uh, whatever. All right. Let's go to Mark in New York, please. Mark. Yes, hi. Booyah, Jim. It's Booyah. always a pleasure to be on the show, and thank you for taking my call. Of course. Okay, just a quick comment. Uh, it's really great to hear young people calling in the show lately, because the earlier they start learning about money, the better, because most of us learn initially by losing it first. So I'd like to thank everyone on CNBC and I've been watching your show since day one. So yes. Thank you very much for the education. Fantastic. Okay. And uh, the symbol I have tonight is IPG. It's Interpublic Group of Companies. I haven't heard much about it. It has a dividend of 4.5%, a, a forward PE of 11 so, Jim, what I want to ask you is, is it a diamond in the rough or a dud? No, I don't want to. The, the advertising stocks are just way too hard. We're not going to. Look, they're cheap. The stock's cheap. But it's just too hard. And, Mark, you've been watching the show since it began. You know I don't like it hard. 
It's much better to find stocks that I think have the tailwinds. And I don't see a lot of tailwinds in that business. Taylor in North Carolina. Taylor. Booyah, Jim. Booyah. Uh, I'm a 22-year-old investor. I've been watching the show with my dad since I was 15 years old. Um, I was looking for some insight on the company Slack for an investor with a long-term time, uh, time horizon. Well, I'll tell you, uh, there's some really interesting data on the Goldman Sachs Conference Call, which talks about what's known as a direct listing and how direct listings have really been unable to be able to find that, subs- that, that really great shareholder base. And that's what's happened to Slack. It does not have because it's still it, it did the wrong kind. Listen, companies that are thinking about doing that, don't do it. We can't figure out what the price discovery is, what it really is worth. So Slack, I don't know, it seems like it's bottom here, but I don't have a case to be made for it. By the way, also, now that uh, Schwab is doing partial stocks, uh, this is a reminder, if the companies can only split their stock, they have a lot more people like it. Right, sure, Netflix quarter w- w- wasn't a total bust, as I said, during this piece, but also at the top. But you know what? It wasn't a total blockbuster either. I wouldn't short it, but I wouldn't own it. Much more man money at. It's a company up more than 350% over the past three years, and you may never even have heard of it, although some of our viewers have. I'm sitting down with the CEO of Arrowhead to see if it continue to rise ahead of tomorrow's big analyst meeting. Then wondering if your portfolio has what it takes this earnings season? I'll be the judge of that when we play MI Reverse Five. And all your calls rapid fire in tonight's edition of The Lightning Round. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.